Hey Diddle Diddle, the Cat and the Fiddle. Since the world began, there have been two Jeremies. The one wrote a Jeremiad about usury and was called Jeremy Bentham. He has been much admired by Mr. John Neal and was a great man in a small way. The other gave name to the most important of the exact sciences and, a, and was a great man in a great way, I may say, indeed, in the very greatest of ways. Diddling, or the abstract idea conveyed by the verb to diddle, is sufficiently well understood. Yet the fact, the deed, the thing, diddling, is somewhat difficult to define. We may get, however, at a tolerably distinct conception of the matter in hand by defining not the thing diddling in itself, but man as an animal that diddles. Had Plato but hit upon this, he would have been spared the affront of the picked chicken. Very pertinently, it was demanded of Plato why a picked chicken, which was clearly a biped without feathers, was not, according to his own definition, a man. But I am not to be bothered by any similar query. Man is an animal that diddles, and there is no animal that diddles but man. It will take an entire hencoop of picked chickens to get over that. What constitutes the essence, the nair, the principle of diddling, is, in fact, peculiar to the class of creatures that wear coats and pantaloons, a crow thieves, a fox cheats, a weasel outwits, a man diddles. To diddle is his destiny. Man was made to mourn, says the poet, but no so. He was made to diddle. This is his aim, his object, his end. And for this reason, when a man's diddled, we say he's done. Diddling, rightly considered, is a compound of which the ingredients are minuteness, interest, perseverance, ingenuity, audacity, nonchalance, originality, impertinence, and grin. Minuteness, your diddler is minute. His operations are upon a small scale. His business is retail for cash or approved paper at sight. Should he ever be tempted into magnificent speculation, he then at once loses his distinctive features and becomes what we term financier. This latter word conveys the diddling idea in, a, in every respect except that of magnitude. A diddler may thus be regarded as a banker in petto. A financial, question, a financial operation as a diddle at Brobdignag. The one is to the other as Homer to Flaccus, as a mastodon to a mouse, as the tail of a comet to that of a pig. Interest, your diddler is guided by self-interest. He scorns to diddle for the mere sake of the diddle. He has an object in view, his pocket and yours. He regards always the main chance. He looks to number one. You are number two and must look to yourself. Perseverance, your diddler perseveres. He is not readily discouraged. Should even the banks break, he cares nothing about it. He steadily pursues his end and ut canis a corio nunquam absterbitur puncto. So he lets go of his game. Ingenuity. Your diddler is ingenious. He has constructiveness large. He understands plot. He invents and circumvents. Were he not Alexander, he would be Diogenes. Were he not a diddler, he would be a maker of patent rat traps or an angler for trout. Audacity. Your diddler is audacious. He is a bold man. He carries the war into Africa. He conquers all by assault. He would not fear the daggers of Frey Heron. With a little more prudence, Dick Turpin would have made a good diddler, with a trifle less blarney, Daniel O'Connell. With a pound or two more brains, Charles the Twelfth. Nonchalance. Your diddler is nonchalant. He is not at all nervous. He never had any nerves. He is never seduced into a flurry. He is never put out unless put out of doors. He is cool, cool as a cucumber. He is calm, calm as a smile from Lady Bury. He is easy, easy as an old glove for the damsels of ancient Bayet. Originality. Your diddler is original, conscientiously so. His thoughts are his own. 
he would scorn to employ those of another. A stale trick is his aversion. He would return a purse, I am sure, upon discovering that he had obtained it by an unoriginal diddle. Impertinence. Your diddler is impertinent. He swaggers. He sets his arm akimbo. He thrusts his hands in his trousers pocket. He sneers in your face. He treads on your corns. He eats your dinner. He drinks your wine. He borrows your money. He pulls your nose. He kicks your poodle. And he kisses your wife. Grin. Your true diddler winds up all with a grin. But this nobody sees but himself. He grins when his daily work is done, when his allotted labors are accomplished. At night, in his own closet, and altogether for his own private entertainment, he goes home. He locks his door. He divests himself of his clothes. He puts out his candle. He gets into bed. He places his head upon the pillow. All is done, and your diddler grins. This is no hypothesis. It is a matter of course. I reason a priori, and a diddle would be no diddle without a grin. The origin of the diddle is referable to the infancy of the human race. Perhaps the first diddler was Adam. At all events, we can trace the science back to a very remote period of antiquity. The moderns, however, have brought it to a perfection never dreamed of by our thick-headed progenitors. Without pausing to speak of the old saws, therefore, I shall content myself with a compendious account of some of the more modern instances. A very good diddle is this. A housekeeper, in want of a sofa, for instance, is seen to go in and out of several cabinet warehouses. At length, she arrives at one offering an excellent variety. She is accosted and invited to enter by a polite and voluble individual at the door. She finds a sofa well adapted to her views, and upon inquiring the price, is surprised and delighted to hear a sum named at least 20% lower than her expectations. She hastens to make the purchase, gets a bill, and receipt leaves her address with a request that the article be sent home as speedily as possible, and retires amid a profusion of bows from the shopkeeper. The night arrives, and no sofa. The next day passes, and still none. A servant is sent to make inquiry about the delay. The whole transaction is denied. No sofa has been sold, no money received, except by the diddler, who played shopkeeper for the nonce. Our cabinet warehouses are left entirely unattended, and thus afford every facility for a trick of this kind. Visitors enter, look at furniture, and depart, unheeded and unseen. Should anyone wish to purchase or to inquire the price of an article, a bell is at hand, and this is considered amply sufficient. Again, quite a respectable diddle is this. A well-dressed individual enters a shop, makes a purchase to the value of a dollar, finds, much to his vexation, that he has left his pocketbook in another coat pocket, and so says to the shopkeeper, My dear sir, never mind, just oblige me. Will you, by sending the bundle home, and stay, but stay, I really believe that I have nothing less than a five-dollar bill even there. However, you can send four dollars in change with the bundle. You know. With the bundle, you know. Very good, sir, replies the shopkeeper, who entertains at once a lofty opinion of the high-mindedness of his customer. I know, fellows, he says to himself, who would just have put the goods under their arm and walked off with a promise to call and pay the dollar as they came by in the afternoon. A boy is sent with the parcel and change. On the route, quite accidentally, he is met by the purchaser, who exclaims, Ah, this is my bundle, I see. I thought you had been home with it. Long ago. Uh, well, go on. My wife, Mrs. Trotter, will give you the five dollars. I left the instructions with her to that effect. The change you might as well give to me. I shall want some silver for the post office. Very good. One, two, this is a good quarter. Three, four, quite right. Say to Mrs. Trotter that you met me, and be sure now and do not loiter on the way. The boy doesn't loiter at all, but he is a very long time in getting back from his errand, for no lady of the precise name of Mrs. Trotter is to be discovered. He consoles himself, however, that he has not been such a fool as to leave the goods without the money, and, re-entering the shop with a satisfied air, feels sensibly hurt and indignant when his master asks him what has become of the change. A very simple diddle, indeed, is this. The captain of a ship is about to sail, is presented by an official-looking person with an unusually moderate bill of city charges, glad to get off so easily, 
and confused by a hundred duties pressing upon him all at once, he discharges the claim forthwith. In about fifteen minutes, another and less responsible and less, and less reasonable bill is handed him by one who soon makes it evident that the first collector was a diddler, and the original collection a diddle. And here, too, is a somewhat similar thing. A steamboat is casting loose from the wharf, a traveler, portmanteau in hand, is discovered running toward the wharf at full speed. Suddenly he makes a dead halt, stoops and picks up something from the ground in a very agitated manner. It is a pocketbook, and, has any gentleman lost a pocketbook, he cries? No one can say that he has exactly lost a pocketbook, but a great excitement ensues when the treasure trove is found to be of value. The boat, however, must not be detained. Time and tide wait for no man, says the captain. For God's sake, stay only a few minutes, says the finder of the book. A true, The true claimant will presently appear. Can't wait, replies the man in authority. Cast off there, do you hear? What am I to do? asks the finder in great tribulation. I am about to leave the country for some years, and I cannot conscientiously retain this large amount in my possession. I beg your pardon, sir, here he addresses a gentleman on the shore, but you have the air of an honest man. Will you confer upon me the favor of taking charge of this pocketbook? I know I can trust you. And of advertising it? The notes, you see, amount to a very considerable sum. The owner will no doubt insist upon rewarding you for your trouble. Me? No, you. It was you who found the book. Well, if you must have it so, I will take a small reward, just to satisfy your scruples. Let me see why these notes are all hundreds. Bless my soul, a hundred is too much to take. Fifty would be quite enough, I am sure. Cast off there, says the captain. But then I have no change for a hundred, and upon the whole you had better... Cast off there, says captain. Never mind, cries the gentleman on shore, who has been ex examining his own pocketbook for the last minute or so. Never mind, I can fix it. Here is a fifty on the bank of, on the bank of North America. Throw me the book. And over the conscientious finder takes the fifty and mark with marked reluctance, and throws the gentleman the book as desired, while the steamboat fumes and fizzes on her way. In about half an hour after her departure, the large amount is seen to be a counterfeit presentiment, presentment, and the whole thing a capital diddle. A bold diddle is this. A camp meeting, or something similar, is to be held at a certain spot which is accessible only by means of a free bridge. A diddler stations himself upon this bridge respectfully informs all passers by of the new county law which establishes a toll of one cent for foot passengers, two for horses and donkeys, and so forth and so forth. Some grumble, but all submit, and the diddler goes home a wealthier man by some fifty or sixty dollars well earned. This taking a toll from a great crowd of people is excessively is an excessively troublesome thing.